everyone. So this lesson is technically covering two sections. It's sections 2.7 and 2.8. So I'm going to do it as two separate videos. And you have homework out of both of those sections in the book. So um, you may want to watch one video and then work on the one section of homework and then watch the other. Or you can watch both videos back to back and then work on both sections of homework. Totally up to you. Okay. Um, the other thing you should know is there is going to be a good amount of calculator work, at least in this first section. So you probably, if you want to follow along with me, will want your calculator handy. Okay. Okay. So um, these two sections are all about modeling with data. And when I talk about a mathematical model, there's this definition here for you. It's in general, anytime that I'm describing a real life situation, and that's the big thing here, real life situations. Um, with math, okay? And typically when, we, when we're representing it with math, it's through an equation, okay? So when we write an equation to represent a real life situation, okay? And you do that a lot already. When, anytime you have like a, a real life scenario that you're representing with an equation, but today we're going to be using data and turning those into equations, okay? So just a couple of things you should know. We've already talked about independent variables and dependent variables, but um, in terms of like a real life context, independent variables are always the thing you can control. Okay, or at least hold at a steady interval. And dependent variables are the things that you're measuring in response to the independent variable. And when I say control, it's, it's not necessarily that you can like manipulate it, but it's the thing that you, the thing that kind of works on its own, okay? And I know that sounds confusing. I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, for example, a lot of the time, time is considered to be an independent variable. You have no control over time, but time keeps ticking along, you know, without you having to manipulate anything, without you having to change anything. Um, so you can measure time in nice equal intervals. And so let's say you wanted to measure the temperature based on the time of day. Okay, so the time of day is what you can sort of watch. Okay, it's what you can measure in steady intervals. And then the dependent variable, the temperature, is what you're looking at in response to what time of day it is. Okay, um, equation-wise, just remember that when you're looking at an equation, the independent variable is actually the one that's kind of buried in the equation, and the dependent variable is the one that's kind of on the outside, okay? But again, we're working more with real life scenarios and less and less with just regular X and Y, okay? Okay, so let's jump into this first scenario here. It says the following gives the water pressure, pounds per square inch, exerted on a diver at various depths. So this diver is diving, you know, lower and lower and lower beneath sea level, okay? And this is the pressure that's being exerted on him. He's measuring it in some way. And we want to somehow represent this with a variation equation. Now the thing is, before we can start um, a variation equation, we need to know which type of variation we're dealing with. So in general, just to help us narrow things down, I can see that when my depth is, is increasing, okay, that's my independent variable. And again, um, well, I guess as a diver, you can control your depth. You can say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dive 10 feet below, now I'm going to dive 25 feet below, and so on. Um, and then the pressure would be like your dependent variable. Okay, so you're, that's what you're measuring in response to the depth that you're diving. And we can see that as our independent variable is getting bigger, as these numbers are going up, my pressure is also going up. So I know that this is some type of direct variation. Okay, I at least have it narrowed down to that. Now, is it regular direct variation? Is it direct square variation? Um, could be lots of things. So what we're going to do is we really want to see these points on a graph. And we could sit and draw this graph by hand, but I'm going to show you a shortcut. I'm going to show you a way to do this with your graphing calculator. 
So in your calculators, and we're going to be doing this process a lot, so um, I'm going to go over this now, but trust me, we're going to go over it again in class if you're still confused. You want to find the um, stat button. Okay, stat is right here under delete. There you go. And by the way, remember the beauty of video is you can pause and rewind anytime. So if you miss a step, if, if I lose you, if I go too fast, you can always stop, rewind, and play through it again. Um, I'm going to go to edit after I hit stat. So stat and edit. Now my calculator has some numbers entered in here. Um, yours may or may not, depending on who's used it before. I'm going to just move my cursor up to the top of L1 and hit the clear button and then hit enter. And that'll empty out the whole list for me. And then same thing here, L2. And now under list one, I'm going to go ahead and type in my independent variable. So 0, 10, 25, 40, 55, and 75. And then in list two, I'm going to do my other numbers. So 0, 4.3, 10.8, 17.2, 32.3. Okay, so you should have the same number of things in list one and list two. Now, if you just want to see these points on a graph, and really what we're looking for is what shape does this make? Here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to go to my Y equals button where I normally type in my graph stuff. And I'm going to clear out anything that's there. Okay? And then up here where it says plot one, I'm going to just highlight that and hit enter. Okay? So now if I move my cursor away from there, see how it's like highlighted? That means that plot one is turned on. These plots are always for when you're plotting like data points like this, not when you're plotting equations. Okay? Now the thing is, I can hit graph right now and see this on a picture. And all you can really see is this one tiny point here, which is 0, 0. And then you've got one point hanging out out here, which is probably this 10, 4.3. And I can't see anything else. Okay? So what you can do on your calculator is if you hit zoom, this is your way of telling your calculator what do you want your calculator to adjust the screen to look at, okay? And there's all these different things. Um, we're going to use some of them this year. But the one you want to look for right now I think is option 9. And it's probably option 9 on just about everybody's calculator. Zoom stat. Okay, so you're looking for zoom stat. And that will always adjust your window to fit anything that you put in here, the stat plots, okay, under the lists. So I'm going to choose Zoom Stat, and now I can see my points, okay? Um, and those points look like they're going in a pretty straight line, all right? Those look linear to me. And so the fact that those points look linear tell me that I'm using plain old direct variation, that my equation is going to look something like this y equals k times x, okay? So again, I put these in here so that I could see the shape of this thing on a graph so that I could decide which one of my variation functions do I want to use. If this had looked like more of a like curve upward, I might think of it as being a parabola instead, okay? Um, but I'll work with this one. And then what I can do to find my k value is just pick any one of these points. You know, usually these problems give you like one set of numbers. You have a whole table full of numbers that works. So I'm going to choose one pair. Now, I would not choose 0, 0, right? Because that's not going to get us any good information. If we put 0 here and 0 here, we're not going to get a k value. Um, but pick any other one you want. I'm going to go with 25 and 10.8. So 25 is my x. 10.8 is my y. Here's my k. And now I'm going to divide by 25, divide by 25, and let's see, 10.8 divided by 25 is 0.432. And so then my overall variation equation, if I plug that back into this, would look like y equals 0.432x. And this is my answer to the problem. Now, a couple of things to point out here. Um, we all know that real life is never perfect, okay? In fact, I think I read somewhere something like, um, the only time numbers work out perfectly is in math textbooks, okay? Um, so 
this relationship, this 0 0.432, it was true for this set of numbers. If I go to another set of numbers, it may or may not be exactly 0 0.432. It might be something close, but maybe not exact. Um, the way I can check that, by the way, is I can plug one of these other x's in with the 0 0.432 and see how close it comes. And I don't remember, I mean, this problem did come out of a math textbook, so it might work out perfectly. Who knows? So I'm going to look at like the 55 and the 23.7. If I do 0.432 times 55, it should equal 23.7. You can see it came up a little bit off, 23.76. That's not a big deal. Okay, that's, that's close enough because um, our data points probably aren't an exact perfect straight line, but they're close enough to where we feel like this equation would model it. And in fact, and you don't have to do this next step necessarily, but... Um, with that plot on, if I went in here and typed in the equation 0.432x and hit graph, you'll see that line come right up with the points. And you can see some of the points it goes straight through them, some of the points it doesn't. That's okay. We're just kind of modeling this in general. Okay? All right, so that's about it for the first one. Let's move on to the second one, and there is something a little bit trickier with example two. Okay? So this time, with example two we're looking at the difference between volume and pressure of a gas, okay? And notice it says she varies the pressure. This right here tells you that your pressure is going to be your independent variable because this is the one that she's controlling. So this is my x, and then I'm measuring the volume based on what the pressure is. And this time, do you notice that as the pressure is getting bigger, if I'm, if I'm making these numbers bigger, look at what's happening to my volume getting smaller. So I know that this is inverse variation just based on that. And if I go ahead and plug those numbers into my calculator like I did before, and here I'll go through the steps again. Stat, edit, I'm going to clear these lists. Oops, enter. List one, I'm going to go quick here. And list two, 383, 55, 32. Okay, so I've got my, my lists in there. Now, if I hit graph right now, I might see a picture. Oh, and I left my line on there too. I'm going to get rid of that line. But if I want to readjust to now fit this new data, I have to go back to zoom and number nine again for zoom stat. And now that picture is much better. Okay, so I hope that you're looking at this and going, hey, that looks kind of like a hyperbola. All right? Here's the problem anytime you're dealing with inverse variation is if you think of these two things on a graph, and I'm going to just draw them really small, we talked about inverse variation looking like that and inverse square variation looking like that. But when we're dealing with data, we're only looking at this much of the graph and notice how they both look the same. Just from looking at this picture, I really don't know if I'm dealing with this or this. Okay? So here's what we have to do. We have to pick one and we have to run with it. And then after we've done all of the work like we did in example one, we have to test it just like I did with example one. And if it's close or if it's exact or if it's close enough, then we're good. If it's not very close, then I have to go back and do the whole thing again with the other type of variation. Okay? So normally I would have you guys pick one. I honestly don't remember the answer. So I'm going to just start with regular inverse. Okay? Because right now I can't answer this question. Does it vary inversely with the pressure or with the square of the pressure? I don't know. So I'm going to start with just regular inverse, which is y equals k over x. Whoops, that should be k over x. And I'm going to plug in a point. I'm going to go with, I don't know, maybe 40 and 42. So 42 is my y. And this would be, whoops. Oh, gosh, sorry, guys. k over 40. And then to solve, I'm going to multiply by 40 and multiply by 40. And so 40 times 42 gives me 1680.
which means my equation, if I go back to my original, I'm sorry, this is getting very scribbly here. If I go back to my original, my equation should now be y equals 1680 over x. But I just totally made up that it was inverse variation. I'm not totally sure, okay? So what I need to do is I need to test a point. And when I test a point, I usually try to pick a point that's a good distance away from the one I started with, okay? Just because if they're too close together, sometimes they look like they're close enough when it's not really. So I'm going to go with like the 80 and the 21. And I'm going to plug those numbers in and see if this works, okay? Really what I'm plugging in is the 80 for x, and I'm going to see, does my answer come out to be 21? So if I do 1680 divided by 80, I get exactly 21, okay? That means that this equation is good. Yay, okay? Um, now let's say I had done all of that. Oh, and I'm sorry, you couldn't even see that I got 21. You were just trusting me. Um, let's say I had done all of that and it had come out to something totally different from 21. Then I would have to back way back up here, turn my equation into inverse square variation, and then redo this whole process. Get a new k value, my k value would have to change, um, and then test the point again. And really it's all about which one works out closer for the other points in the function. Okay. Again, only is a problem with inverse variation because when we did direct variation up here, it's really easy to see the difference between a straight line and a curved line, okay? But with um, hyperbolas, you can't tell the difference in that first quadrant. Okay, so now we have our equation here. Let me just, because I know this is all scribbly. This is our equation that we ended up coming up with. And we can now, because this worked for another point, I can say it varies inversely not with the square of the inverse, okay? And so now to predict the volume of the gas when the pressure is 45 PSI, remember the pressure was my X, so I can plug in 45, and I can do 1680 divided by 45, which comes out to be 37.3. Okay, and I don't remember what our units was for volume, probably milliliters, but um, I should check in my, in my table and make sure 45 would fall between 40 and 50, okay? So I want to make sure this number makes sense, and it's somewhere between 42 and 33, so yeah, I'd say that answer is reasonable for my volume. Okay, that's it for these two examples. Like I said, if you would like to take some time and start section 2-7, um, right now and then come back for the rest of 2.8, that's fine. If you want to continue with the videos and then do all the homework at the end, that's fine too.